welcome everyone today, and we're so glad to have you. I'm Amanda Panzar, and I'm the Chief Communications and Strategy Officer here at Community Health Charities. And we are just delighted today to have Jerome Tenniel with us from Marriott International. He's the manager of volunteerism there. And we recently became friends with Jerome. He spoke at our employee engagement summit in New York City about skilled volunteering and how to make that work for your organization. Had some really great insights. And we thought it would be helpful to have him present some of his thoughts on how to maximize corporate partnerships and his experience on what makes those successful and what nonprofit organizations can be doing better to um, achieve the greatest impact through these partnerships. So again, we're thrilled to have him, and I know he wouldn't want you to know this, but today is uh, Jerome's birthday, so please uh, join us in wishing him a silent happy birthday clap since we're all on mute here, and we will turn it over to Jerome um, in a minute. Remember, if you have questions throughout, just type in the chat pod, and we'll be watching that so that at the end of Jerome's presentation, we'll be able to get those questions to him, and he'll answer as many as he can. So thank you again for joining us, and Jerome, please take it away. Good morning, and uh, thank you again, um, uh, and thank you for the uh, well birthday, the, the birthday wishes. Um, I very much appreciate it. Um, before I begin, what I'd like to do is share a little bit more about my background, um, because I think it's really important to understand um, the lens that I'm looking through as I'm providing this information. So uh, I served in the military for about eight years. I served in the U.S. Navy. And when I left the military, I transitioned into a position at a nonprofit organization uh, in 2012. And I uh, began a career in the nonprofit sector uh, where I managed the volunteer program nationally for a, a national veteran service organization headquartered in Arlington, Virginia. I did that for about six years. And I recently transitioned um, about a year ago to Mary International and I, now I manage their uh, volunteer programming, and uh, the scope of that is uh, global, but I also have a, a focus on how we do that from our corporate headquarters um, in the D.C. Uh, area. Uh, I attended Arizona State University. I did my undergrad in operations management to understand uh, supply chain management specifically, and went to grad school and studied uh, sustainability. I am also certified in volunteer administration, uh, and that is sort of a nod to um, getting my roots in this field from the nonprofit sector. Now, again, I share all this because um, I think my perspective is very different than most who work in CSR. Um, I believe that most in CSR, they come from a very traditional business acumen of marketing, public relations, human resources. Um, they don't um, oftentimes come with a background in nonprofit management. Um, and so again, I share that because one of the things that I'm most passionate about is um, helping people bridge that divide that is um, oftentimes experienced between uh, corporate partners and the nonprofits that they seek to serve. Um, I think there are things that I know now um, that I feel strong that if I knew several years ago would have helped in my success. And I hope today that I'm able to share some of these insights and perspectives um, that will help you make a greater connection with your corporate partners. So what is CSR uh, or corporate social responsibility? Um, generally speaking, CSR is considered an overhead expense um, for the cash generating side of any company, uh, which is why you see this photo with the CSR sort of uh, on the back of the, uh, the company that is designed to make money. Um, you know, while CSR is very important functions, um, as we've seen, um, I would say in the last um, five to 10 years, we've seen a, a, an explosion of companies who have taken, uh, taken social responsibility um, much more seriously in terms of putting resources behind it. Um, it's still very new in terms of a profession or a field. Um, you know, most companies have not connected the dots yet between volunteerism and how that makes satisfied employees or the connectedness to the, uh, to the company or how volunteerism can help um, their employees have a higher performance in their day-to-day -day jobs uh, or ultimately um, you know, figuring out how volunteerism uh, increases the profits um, to their business side. Um, and so again, you know, as a result, most companies, they see the positions in CSR 
like mine, managing a volunteer program, very similar to non-program expenses that you would see at a nonprofit organization. Um, when budgets for the company are tight, my, my specific resources to engage employees in volunteerism um, are um, reduced. So what does CSR actually encompass? Well, again, generally speaking, CSR is everything from initiatives and sustainability, diversity and inclusion, supplier diversity, employee engagement, employee experience, um, ethics and governance of a company. But again, this can take on um, many different forms. And uh, it's really important to understand that these initiatives often live within specific business units of a company um, that um, are independently managed by um, employees who do not have a CSR background. And so um, there happens to be a lot of overlap in how the CSR department works with a lot of these other uh, business units. Um, and there are oftentimes uh, very clear owners to each of the pro programmatic functions that exist. And so using Mary as an example, when I think of like um, the Department for Sustainability and Supplier Diversity, um, this is essentially managed or owned by four very specific entities. So um, the sustainability team, they really drive the strategy. But then the second team that's involved is the Americas team, and they're the ones who really engage on the property level with our 6,700 properties. Um, there's the global designs team, and the global designs team, they're the ones who architect and construct um, the actual hotels and work to do that in a more um, environmentally um, uh, sustainable way. And then there's the food and beverage team who works to uh, source the food um, for, you know, for all the different hotels who are feeding guests. And again, I share all that to really illustrate how important buy-in is uh, for folks in my field. Um, the people doing the, uh, the actual work um, oftentimes don't have uh, the CSR background that you would think in a traditional sense. And so uh, more specifically with my position here, while I manage all the volunteers and programming, it really requires that I work directly with counterparts and all these different specific um, business units um, who aren't necessarily responsible to me. And that's why I, I always talk about my role here um, and the work that I do isn't, it's not a you shall type of work. Um, it's, uh, uh, it really requires that I'm building relationships internal to the, organiz internal to the company um, to leverage those to the benefit of the communities that we serve. All right, so what for-profit companies are not? Um, the first thing that I'll really say here is that companies, um, we have limited resources despite optics. So um, everything that we do in terms of volunteerism, it has to exist within the limitations of a business that is designed to make money first and foremost. Um, what you'll find is that companies will only really extend programming to the extent that it doesn't harm their bottom line as a company. Um, companies that cannot initiate CSR programming if they're not successful um, with the product that they're producing or the operations. And so when I'm thinking about Marriott International specifically, um, all of those who work directly in CSR at our headquarters office uh, specifically, um, again, we are considered overhead costs. So um, we're not revenue generating um, like the 6,700 properties that, um, that make money through guest stays. So when we are pushing out or initiating our volunteer, um, our volunteer programming, or there's a call to action that we are working to get um, our associates behind, if what we are pushing to the properties, to their, all of our hotels, um, in terms of strategy, um, if it doesn't work for their operations, then it's oftentimes dead on arrival. Uh, in terms of our CSR goals, uh, it's Marriott's uh, properties that will achieve, you know, 99% of all the CSR goals that we set for the company. Um, but before they can even do that, um, they have to be able to make money. Um, otherwise, uh, you know, it's only really after that point that they can really donate and offer volunteers. And so the, the key takeaway for this slide is that, you know, in terms of a business that is designed to make money, um, it's important to really understand that um, volunteerism, it has to be operations friendly. Otherwise, we're not really able to, to push it out to the rest of our employees. 
So without actually guessing this photo, um, I imagine most of you know exactly what this is. Um, when you're looking at this, uh, you know, this is our single day of service. Um, and uh, this is what most organizations are expected to participate in by their uh, corporate counterparts. Um, this specific photo is from the MLK day, day of service at our Bethesda North Marriott you know, here in Montgomery County. This was back in uh, January of 2018. And um, as you're looking at this, you know, I imagine that um, this photo looks like chaos. And um, having stood in that room and trying to wade through the crowd, um, I can tell you that it, it in fact was um, very chaotic. Um, there are over 800 volunteers that served um, 58 different organizations over a four hour period. And so I share this photo because I think this is something that most of you can identify with in terms of what corporate partners might be seeking or um, more importantly, um, the single, you know, the, the dreaded single day of service, um, which is something I really want to talk about um, because I think that it's not a sustainable way of service, but it's something that corporate partners are oftentimes seeking. And so what I hope to do is to be able to equip you guys with, an, with a way to, to look at this and to um, creatively think at ways that you can engage in this type of work that actually meets your mission or to, at the end of the day, if it's not a good fit, to have the courage to also say, no, thank you. All right, so let's talk about getting beyond the single day of service. Uh, again, you know, I call it the dreaded single day of service for um, that very specific reason. Um, I've been on that side, um, being approached by a company um, who wanted to get 300 people engaged for a three hour period on a very specific date. Um, most organizations are not designed to receive services that way. Um, you know, for some companies, this is driven by optics um, to really communicate what a company is doing for the community. Um, however, again, the reality is that these single day of services um, by themselves aren't sustainable. And when you're engaging companies, the larger the company, the less sustainable in execution and impact um, it may become. For example, a small business that has about 50 employees or 50 associates, it's much easier to influence and to modulate um, what they can really engage in versus a company that has 10,000 employees versus a company that has 600,000 employees like Marriott. Um, and so to put this in a greater context, um, from our headquarters here in Bethesda, Maryland, which is in the DC area, um, one of my responsibilities responsibilities that I'm charged with is lining up service projects for over 3,700 associates. And so um, there are a lot of complications, as you can imagine, um, when trying to place that number of associates at any single organization or any number of organizations. Uh, this most recent year, we were able to place um, 2,800 associates at 51 different project sites. Um, and again, you know, the challenge is that many companies will plan their day of service um, oftentimes far too late to plan with any real deliberate uh, impact. Um, and the outcomes are oftentimes, um, you know, being a CSR practitioner, um, approaching an organization in a way that inadvertently creates a cost or time burden for that organization that they're seeking to serve. And so one of the questions that I always um, ask my colleagues here internally, and also um, would, like organizations to ask of themselves is, is a single day of service, is it a part of the problem? Is it perpetuating um, behaviors that we don't necessarily want to see from our corporate partners? So let's think about some strategies. Um, so how do we actually get beyond a single day of service? Um, I think in many instances, this requires that we're looking at things uh, very long term, and you sort of have to ask yourself, what type, of, what type of programming can we build that is friendly for corporate partners? Um, you know, and again, I say that sort of uh, meaning, what can you build for your corporate partners that does not um, diminish the integrity of your programs? And so what I'm going to do is sort of share a quick story about when I was working in a nonprofit sector and some of the things that we encountered and how we sort of got around um, this single day of service challenge that we were facing. 
Um, when I was at TAPS, um, we ran into this issue probably several times a month. Um, as an organization, um, we provided grief and bereavement services to military families who had lost loved ones who were serving in the, in the military at the time of their loss. Um, we relied heavily on um, mental health professionals um, who, who would provide their expertise in uh, counseling and grief and bereavement work. Um, and so we didn't necessarily have a need for you know, 100 employees to come out and to create a tangible item that would then be donated somewhere else. Um, and so we really had to look internally to say, okay, well, what can we do? Uh, what can we create that's going to be, um, that's also going to help our, propel our mission forward while not diminishing the programs or services that we provide while also being inclusive um, to our corporate partners and some of the things that they're looking uh, to to uh, to connect with, and what it actually required is that we took a step back and we really looked at our mission and our four core services, and really um, looked at all the feedback that we were getting from our families in terms of what is going to provide them healing, and um, it was through a lot of thought um, that we actually created a whole new program. Um, one of the biggest pieces of feedback that we received um, is that for our families, one of the most important things for them was that they knew that other people did not forget about their loss or their sacrifice and that their loved one was not forgotten. And we created a program called Thousands of Thanks. And the idea about this program is that we would be able to um, give an outlet for our corporate partners to express their gratitude or their thanks or even their um, honoring our families through uh, the creation of what we called uh, thank you trees or thank you forests. And again, you know, as an organization, we would host about 60 plus events across the nation annually. And we would have decorations around the venue of these trees um, that were, again, created to really inspire hope. And so what you see here on this slide um, are several photos. But what you see is that um, with standard construction paper, we were able to um, carve out what would be leaves on a tree. We were, we were able to package all of these um, construction cutouts of these leaves with markers put them in a box, send them to our corporate partners, and our corporate partners were then able to um, create an event on their campus where uh, their employees had an opportunity to share what they felt um, that they wanted our families to know. Um, obviously, we would provide them guidelines, things that, um, that were appropriate, and then also things to stay away from. We would provide them the guidelines to say, make sure that it's nothing that's overtly um, religious or political um, so that it was uh, inclusive. But this was something that was relatively low cost. Um, we could put it in the mail. We can send it to uh, any of our corporate partners um, uh, anywhere across the nation. Um, they could have a, an employee uh, volunteerism activity where their employees write their heartfelt messages on these um, construction printouts. They would send it back to us. And then we would, um, you know, ahead of one of our events, we could then take these cutouts, assemble all of these trees. And um, while optically it might seem like it was just something nice to do for the families, um, when our families uh, arrived at these events and they were um, met with all these trees and all this decoration and they had the opportunity to read, what these employee, this corporate uh, volunteers um, uh, expressed on these leaves, um, for them, that was just another reminder, another reinforcer that their sacrifice, that their loss, that their loved one has not been forgotten. And that fed directly into one of our core services. And so again, you know, that's just one thing that we did as, a, as an organization um, that provided an opportunity for our corporate partners. Um, but, it, you know, we had to, again, look internally to say, okay, well, what can we do that meets their corporate need 
but while also adding value um, to the mission of, of providing grief and bereavement services. Uh, and that was something that we were able to um, um, create. And it was, uh, in this instance, it's a, it's a program, even though I've been out of TAPS for a year now, it's a program that they, that they still really push out there and it means the world to the families. And so that being said, um, when I think about these strategies, um, you know, I think this really requires that um, you're extremely proactive in how you do this. And it might also take um, an inward looking approach first and foremost to figure out, well, depending on what that corporation is seeking, is there a way that we can rejigger our programs to accommodate it in a way that doesn't really sacrifice the integrity of our programming? Um, so again, being very proactive is key. Um, so if you know that there is a single day of service um, that is held on a specific month or on a specific day with your corporate partners, get ahead of this and ask to offer or ask an offer to help plan the single day of service um, months in advance with the CSR practitioner um, that you're currently working with. Um, you know, using Mary International as an example, um, for our headquarters office and with some of the other corporate offices that we have here on the east coast you know we conduct a single day of service on the same day every year and so for us it's the same wednesday leading into memorial day weekend and it has been for the last 20 years so our nonprofit neighbors um, they can often anticipate this um, us doing a project more specifically and uh, they have an opportunity to, to reach out as far in advance as they'd like now for our properties, our 6,700 properties globally, um, they are in a different situation. Um, they usually host their day of service in the month of May rather than just a specific day. And um, the reason behind that is uh, the flexibility. Uh, they need the flexibility for uh, their operational requirements. And so for a company like ours, uh, where we are um, heavily or highly decentralized, um, you, know, you might see some variance in those days. Um, you know, for our headquarters, again, um, those that we have charitable relationships with, um, they're in a sense lucky that I'm their point of contact because I start planning for this um, a year in advance. So for 2019, I started planning uh, three or four months ago. And right now we're still currently working on designing a day of service that actually works for each of these organizations. Uh, we serve about 50, 60, 50 to 60 organizations from our corporate headquarters uh, here in the DC area. And so for me, it takes about a year um, to do this correctly and in a way that doesn't jeopardize the, the nonprofit organizations that we are seeking to serve. Um, and so again, um, being proactive, what I do recommend is that um, each of you, if you, if you guys have point of contacts, um, at um, the respective companies that you work with, um, connect with these folks as soon as possible. Um, provide feedback. I would encourage everybody to provide feedback on what works, what doesn't work, and most importantly is why it works or why it doesn't work. And then after that, learn more about what they're seeking. Um, you know, maybe they're seeking volunteerism as a goal centered on employee engagement and just delivering a great time to their employees, and that's it. Um, we can debate whether that's right or wrong, um, but I think the most important thing here is to understand their motivations. Um, not to scrutinize them, but rather to really understand how to capitalize on those motivations. And this, uh, you know, stay in your lane. Um, this is something that I, I learned over this past year um, to not ask for money. And this is, this is tricky and this probably requires a longer conversation, but um, I believe it's incredibly important that the volunteer coordinator seeking volunteers really stay in their lane um, in terms of volunteerism and how to engage a company. Um, even if you split your role with development or in development, um, don't solicit for money unless it's um, been expressed by the company that that is the reason for a meeting. Um, there are several reasons for this, um, but the only one I've seen the biggest knee-jerk reaction to right now is that um, there are um, hypersensitivities um, to being solicited for funds. And I can go into all the factors about why this is, um, but without going into all the details, 
um, I would just caution um, those who are engaging in volunteerism to avoid asking for funding. Um, I say that also understanding that volunteerism is not free. It, it also comes with a cost. Um, by accommodating a company, there are large numbers of, uh, you know, the large number of associates, uh, there is an increased cost um, of time um, for staff and money uh, or even supplies. Just understand that by soliciting for funds that um, that might pay for these volunteer activities to exist, um, it might come off as a pay to play scheme. And if that's the case, then it might be met with resistance. Um, and so this is my one recommendation that I would give to, to any volunteer coordinator is if you're in a tough place um, and you really do need funding for, uh, for volunteer service, I would work to turn this funding gap into a challenge that your corporate partners need to be an equal partner to solve for. Um, I would do three things. Um, I would educate them on why the nonprofit isn't optimized for this type of service. Secondly, I would connect the dots and show them why planning a single day of service inadvertently increased costs of both uh, staff time and, and funds. And then without asking directly for money, I would ask them, how might they be able to help solve for this issue, right? And I think in those instances, you put the ball back in their court to work to solve a challenge that they might inadvertently be creating. Um, and I think that's probably, again, this could be a much longer conversation and I'm very happy to have greater conversation with folks beyond this webinar. But I think that that's probably um, gonna be met with less resistance and it's gonna, um, I think, ultimately um, create the partnerships that you actually want. Is when you have an equal partner who wants to solve for those issues, um, I think that's where you're going to really find the magic. All right, so what I really want to do now is I want to go through some slides and um, I want to give you a little bit of insight of how we support uh, as a company and how our company functions. Um, you know, without going into uh, a full exercise on this, what I really want to illustrate here is the importance of understanding who you're engaging uh, and I wanna do this by using Marriott International as an example. And I will preface all of this by saying all of the slides and all the information that I'm about to present to you is all publicly available. So a year ago, we actually went through a corporate responsibility refresher. Um, we have a new um, sustainability and social impact platform that guides all of our decisions and it's called Serve 360 because we are doing good in every direction. Um, it is broken up into four big areas, but each of these areas are connected with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Um, when we did a refresher, we did not want to create goals in a, within a vacuum or a silo. We wanted to connect to something that was global and bigger than us, understanding that we are in 127 countries. But these are the four buckets, and this is sort of a broad overview of the, the areas that we really focus on. Under the Nurture Our World, um, we really do focus on natural capital investment. Uh, we also serve the disadvantaged populations with a very specific emphasis on um, youth development. And when I say youth, I'm talking the United Nations definition of the ages 15 to 24. And then um, we also have uh, a portion for vitality of children. And I just wanna make a note that vitality of children is very specific to two organizations, um, Children's Miracle Network Hospitals, which is our longest standing and most mature philanthropic partnership of 35 years. And then very specifically for the Ritz-Carlton brand, Make-A-Wish is an organization that as a specific brand they support. Under uh, Empower Through Opportunity, um, we focus on um, youth, women, people with disabilities, uh, refugees, and veterans. And a lot of that is uh, um, skills-based volunteerism to develop the employability of these, uh, of these communities. Um, while also connecting the dot between developing their employability and also sourcing them for talent. And then the sustained responsible operations is um, less about volunteerism, but more about um, 
eliminating food waste in our hotels, um, increasing our, our recycling, and then being more environmentally and energy uh, efficient and, and how our operations work on uh, hotel properties. And then the last focus area here is welcome all and advance human rights. Um, and the, the, the big focus there is uh, eliminating human trafficking um, while we're also focused on uh, human rights and LGBTQ um, uh, societal challenges um, more broadly. And so while that was sort of a, 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 a sort of a broad overview of what we support as a company, um, the next part I want to really cover here is um, how we function as a company. Um, and again, as we sort of go through all these slides, um, we'll get to a point where we do a little bit of analysis and um, we get to look at the pros and the cons and how that might affect how an organization connects with us as a company. Um, so many of those outside the hospitality industry are um, largely unfamiliar with how the hospitality industry functions, how we generate revenue, how our business structure is like. Um, and so, again, what we're going to do is talk a little bit about how we function as a company uh, because I really want to reinforce a point. I'm going to give you sort of a quick down and dirty run through of how we're structured. And then, again, we'll talk through how that might impact a, a volunteer engagement effort. So Mary International, um, we've been here for 91 years now. Um, we are the largest hospitality company or hotel company rather uh, on the planet. We have about 13% of all the hotels on the planet. Uh, we were actually um, founded on the principle of serving our world and serving others the way that we would like to be served. And so we do believe that volunteerism perpetuates the Marriott culture. Uh, serve our world is one of our core, um, our uh, five core values as a company. Um, again, you know, we acquired Starwood two years ago, and when we acquired Starwood as a company, um, we really just increased our geographic um, representation. So now we're in 127 countries. We have um, 6,700 properties and then um, several hundred that are actually being constructed. And we have close to 700,000 associates. Um, the two places that I do want to just mention here um, is that 90% of our associates are hourly. So these are the associates who work on property. Uh, this is the housekeeping staff. They work in the back of the house, so the cooks, the concierge, uh, the front office staff who help with uh, guest days and check-ins. Um, and um, a majority of those associates work on our properties, and over 70% of our hotels are franchised, very similar to um, McDonald's in that they are uh, independently owned and operated, but they fly the Marriott flag because they meet a very specific brand standard. Um, from a corporate office, in terms of, of how we do business, a lot of the strategy, whether it be marketing or corporate responsibility um, or uh, training or human resources, a lot of the strategy is designed by our corporate office where we create the policies and the guidelines and the tools to train, equip, and empower people to do the, to do the work on a property level. Um, from a corporate responsibility perspective, um, while we try to um, change behaviors to, to match or marry up with those that we would like to see exhibited um, uh, on the property, we don't directly influence how the properties do business. Uh, again, the properties, uh, they make their own decisions on where and who to give to philanthropically. And then when we actually look at the funding, it's always important to understand, and this goes back to one of the slides I had talked about uh, previously, is um, there is a, a perception that we have a lot of money as a company or that certain companies have a lot of money. Um, so I want to say that you know when we look at our funding, the funding is segmented into three different areas. There's the corporate contributions, and that's uh, I have a counterpart here at Marriott who um, who manages our corporate contributions as Marriott International, but then there's the Jay Willard and Alice S. Marriott Foundation, and the foundation is separate from the company. Um, they are not a part of the corporate entity at all. They are their own legal um, uh, governed organization, and um, 
what I will say about the, the Marriott Foundation is that that's where most of the money resides. I think last year, if you look at public statements, uh, last year they, um, they dished out over $40 million, um, and that's from annuities. Um, and again, that is separate from money that we push here from a corporate office. Um, in terms of corporate contributions, uh, the corporate contributions are close to a 20th of what the Marriott Foundation has. And then the hotels and the properties more specifically, um, they have their own philanthropic endeavors based on our strategy, but all of their cash and in-kind contributions and volunteerism are um, delegated at the property level. All right, so this is the part where we sort of go through the different pros and the cons and what this really means. So I'm not gonna read each of, each of these, but what I am going to do is focus on a handful of these because I think a couple of these are important. So what this might mean for you is that a pro of all of this is that, you know, the properties, they have the latitude to make their own decisions. Um, the properties and the associates, you know, they support their specific market and their community the, the way that they believe is um, going to best meet those needs and those critical issues in the community. And so as you're working to build relationships, it's oftentimes most helpful to have uh, the connection at the local level. Um, it, it, always helps, it always helps to have a connection at the, at the corporate level, but at the, at the local level is where, um, again, where the magic is going to happen because that's going to be the general manager, that's going to be the director of human resources who has those assets on property um, to bear. Um, that they can put into action for your specific organization. Um, from the property level, um, we have a lot of skills in customer service and hospitality, food and beverage, um, event management, culinary and nutrition. Uh, and while all of those might not be a great fit for, uh, for every organization, you know, customer service is one that we've highlighted as, um, as one that can really add value to the nonprofit sector. Um, most nonprofit organizations serve a a client base or a community or constituents in some way, shape or form, uh, event management, um, most nonprofit organizations um, uh, host their own galas, their own fundraising um, mechanisms and have their own uh, events that they manage. Uh, and then, you know, the food and beverage and the culinary component, those things might be better suited for um, food kitchens or uh, food distribution centers. Um, but these are the type of skills that you can get from those who are on property. And then when we look at some of the some of the negatives of the way that we are designed as a company, um, I'm going to focus on uh, four or five here. But you know, understanding that 90% of our associates are um, hourly, um, that might mean that they are more time poor, right? So when we're talking about volunteer opportunities, they probably have limited time to get off of the property. Um, you know, most of our associates, um, because of the type of profession that they work in, where they are guest interfacing or they work uh, in the back of the house, you know, they don't work in front of a computer terminal like I do every single day. So virtual opportunities might be um, less readily available to them. They might not get e-newsletters. Um, and so the way that you communicate with these uh, associates um, will likely differ. And in terms of um, skills, uh, the types of skills that they have on property are going to be different than what we have here at our corporate office. But what we've also seen is as we um, refine our work in our skills-based volunteer programming, um, we're seeing that a lot of associates on property um, sometimes undervalue their skills. And they say, well, I'm just a housekeeper or I am just a cook. And so as you're, as you're engaging with properties or as you're engaging associates, um, that might impact the skills-based opportunities because they might undervalue their skills or what they can offer. Um, and then the last thing that I'll mention is, you know, having gone through that, uh, those, those two exercises there, um, you know, what is likely more clear now is that Marriott generally doesn't provide volunteers for um, areas like animal welfare or animal rights. Um, healthcare related causes outside of Children's Miracle Network hospitals or Make-A-Wish, um, sports initiatives, elder or hospice care. And so what does this ultimately mean for you? Well, this means that you really have to do your research before you engage any company. 
whether it's a small business or a global company, I think the research that you do will help you really navigate the, the relationship. Um, using Mary International, again, as an example, everything you just learned is publicly available, but is likely wiped out some preconceived notion on how we might support an organization. You know, knowing what you know now, you might need to go back to, you know, to the drawing board to determine a new approach on how you can engage, or worst case scenario, you just now learned that um, by just the way that we function as a company and the things that we support, we're not going to help propel your mission as an organization. Um, you know, unlike foundations, many companies don't really communicate what they support. Um, a handful of large companies do, but many small companies don't. And so the research becomes incredibly important because there's a um, there's quite a bit that you'll be able to find out by Googling a business and just seeing what their products are, who their customers are, and um, also just as important is um, what they've been involved in um, just through uh, local news. And so when I look at this and how this impacts service projects using Marriott as a, a, an example specifically, based on all the publicly available information, when I look at this, you know, I think of, you know, specific to a location. Many associates, um, they're, they likely can't get away from their properties. So it might be unrealistic to ask that these associates come to an event that's, that's not being housed on, on their property specifically. Um, you know, there are also some organizations that this works for, and there are others that just this, that model of volunteerism just won't work for. In terms of how communication to associates is done, it won't likely be electronic given our business and how um, our associates have access or a limited access to, um, to, the, to the internet. So what that means is that you'll have to build relationships with key staff members who can engage their associates face to face on a human level. Um, and again, you know, for me, having been in your position, I know it's incredibly hard to get away from the office. Um, for some of these service projects, but in any instance where a company says, oh, well, don't worry, we can host this for you and you don't really have to show up because we can go ahead and we can manage the day. All you have to do is tell us what we're gonna be doing. Um, while that's a really nice and enticing offer, especially when you're, um, you're in the day-to-day -day work um, and you might not have an opportunity to just get away for a few hours and to, to, to manage uh, an event, what I would actually say is to don't accept that specific offer. And what I would also recommend is that you offer to be present. Um, you know, in my experience, it's truly best if you're on site because right there you have an opportunity to really infiltrate. Um, and, and I use the word infiltrate in the most positive way. But what I really mean is that you can connect with their associates at every level. This includes your senior leadership all the way down to the to lower level associates. Um, this is an opportunity to really make those personal connections and to really stir up the passion uh, and educate others. And I say that because I'm, I'm a single person in my position that oversees um, the volunteer program, but it's, at the end of the day, it's going to be all the associates that we connect with the organizations that we serve that will end up becoming more valuable to those organizations um, as key volunteers that ultimately become passionate about those organizations. And that's what I, you know, that's what I really want to see is that our associates are connecting with these organizations in, on a personal level. And so by your being present at these opportunities on their campus, um, that gives you the, the ability to really connect in a way that's very genuine and, and, um, and provides you a little bit of a, of a foot in the door. And then the last thing that I'll talk about here is education. Um, you know, I see that volunteerism, to me, it's, um, it's just more than just serving an organization. Um, to me, it has an opportunity to eliminate um, challenges that we, that we have, like implicit bias. Um, you know, it, we're able to promote diversity, and we're also able to connect people with the critical issues in the community that they may not understand or may, may have an incorrect perception of. And so any opportunity that you have have to get face to face with uh, employees, um, I would say take it. This is an opportunity to change behaviors that'll serve you and serve um, more importantly, the community um, in, in, a, in a better way, in a deeper way. All right, so mutual benefit. Um, you know, one of the things that I'm, that I'm talking about here is more so, you know, positioning volunteerism as a business 
business solution. And so I'm going to go through two different case studies here um, very briefly. Uh, I know that we're coming up on our time, um, but we're going to go through this. And I just want to share with you how we do this as a company. All right. So when we talk about volunteerism, I believe that volunteerism it can really solve for business challenges. Um, as a company, you know, one of our goals is to eliminate the food waste and serve the communities in need. So we connect with the food banks um, who also have those same, uh, those same goals. We donate the food and that really contributes to uh, eliminating our food waste goals and getting food waste um, out of our hotels. But as a result, now the, uh, this food pantry, now they have to stock their pantry and now they need um, to sort and organize the new food that they just received from us. So as a company, now Marriott, we can volunteer in their warehouse. And that right there, you know, the volunteerism specifically, it contributes to our, um, our large global goal of contributing to 15 million hours by the year 2025. And now all of a sudden, they also need to update their process uh, to receive and distribute the food. And so now our Marriott uh, culinary and food and beverage team, they're using their skills as volunteers to develop this process at this food pantry. And um, that really contributes to um, the skills-based goal that we have as a company. And so what you'll see there is that we're able to meet some of our philanthropic needs, making the continent presidents happy, um, but we're also able to meet the needs of this specific food bank that we are partnered with here uh, in Montgomery County so that now they can serve 47 other organizations that are underneath their umbrella. And so when I talk about mutual benefit, um, I talk about shared value. We're able to meet our sustain and our nurture goals, and the, the food bank is also getting what they need for the community. And then the second thing that I'll talk about here is, um, you know, using volunteerism as a means to uh, shore up some of our staffing um, challenges. Right now, with 4% four, uh, 4 unemployment in, the, uh, in America, um, nobody's really, um, coming to the hotel industry, knocking on doors for opportunities. Uh, and so there's a very proactive way that we can get um, to solving this business challenge that we have. So the goal is to hire new associates from diverse populations because we have a staffing need. So we can connect with professional organizations who their mission is to develop the employability of the underserved community. And so through skills-based volunteerism, you know, we're able to um, provide experiential training, job shadow opportunities, resume writing, interview etiquette, and the program participants from all these different organizations are now having an opportunity to round off their edges as professionals. This again, it contributes to our 15 million hours by the 2025 uh, goal, and it also contributes to the skills-based goal that we have. And then again, the byproduct of that is now we're introducing uh, participants to an industry that they may not have ever considered. Um, and we're, you know, again, immersing them in a hospitality and we're eliminating um, stereotypes and stigmas of our industry. And if done correctly, we're also able to open the door to opportunities through human resources and talent acquisition and the participants, they graduate with more skills. And, and in a perfect world, uh, these program grads, um, these program grads uh, will get hired by uh, industry leaders um, at Hilton, Hyatt, Marriott, or um, other hospitality companies. And so when I talk about mutual benefit, what I'm also talking about is the, the, um, the shared value that you can get by engaging in a way where it is a win-win scenario. And then again, the hotel operators and the general managers are happy. So even though we just showcased some examples, um, the reality is that sometimes things just aren't simply a good fit. And you know, this photo here illustrates, you know, you could have the greatest suit in the world, but if you are not the right size or the right fit for the suit, then it then it's just not a, a good marriage to be to be had. So at the end of the day. If what's being offered doesn't work, don't force it, just say no. Um, I've seen this, you know, if a company is truly interested in you, they'll double back around and they'll look for opportunities to connect. Um, just note that if a company is only exploring things for, um, for other reasons, they'll likely stop pursuing because um, what they are seeking doesn't exist with you 
or because it's not easy enough for them. And if they don't traditionally serve your cause area, there's a really good chance that even if they volunteer with you once, um, nothing more will materialize to a deeper relationship because it happens to be off strategy. So that's something to really keep in mind as you're creating these partnerships. <clears throat> and so when I'm thinking about TAPS as an example with Marriott, um, TAPS is an organization, you know, their mission is grief and bereavement um, to um, veterans and military families. Um, but grief and bereavement isn't necessarily a focus area for Marriott. Um, but veterans and youth happens to be um, one of those focus areas. And so um, TAPS, you know, they do have a youth programs where they connect veterans with um, surviving children. <clears throat> so if I'm thinking about this in the instance where Marriott would support TAPS, um, you know, this would need to be focused on developing the employability of the veterans or the youth uh, in fields like hospitality or the development of veterans uh, who are serving as mentors for the youth by providing them uh, customer service skills that will make them more effective in that role that they play. Um, but um, direct service or direct support um, by funding or providing volunteers for their grief and bereavement program specifically wouldn't be within strategy. So I say all that because I think in a lot of these in a lot of these instances, it's going to take some creativity to really look at things in um, in a less than black and white picture. And this slide um, this touches on something that I uh, previously um, covered just very briefly. And it's really uh, about staying in one's lanes. <clears throat> I'll tell you a, a personal pet peeve of mine. It's when uh, I seek to engage an organization and they send me to the development professional when I'm seeking volunteer opportunities specifically. This is often the case when, with most CSR practitioners, um, but for very different reasons. My reasons are personal to me having uh, served as a, a volunteer engagement professional at, uh, at a nonprofit organization. And what I've seen um, in both the nonprofit sector and working in CSR is that um, sometimes the development associate um, will seek volunteer engagement as a means to getting funding as a result. Um, you know, this is one of those um, areas where the tail ends up wagging the dog. Um, when this happens, um, you know, this leaves the volunteer engagement professional um, to reactively create volunteer opportunities to satisfy the needs of the development officer and not um, satisfying the direct needs that the, the volunteers um, should be um, uh, more focused on. And to me, and again, this is personal to me, but um, this is something that is, in my opinion, very backwards. And you know, I say this because, you know, I view the volunteer engagement role as being a very strategic role. Um, it's as important as the development officer um, and also needs a place at the strategic planning table. And so that's my perspective on it. However, um, I imagine that most CSR practitioners aren't like me or have my same background. So here's what I'll tell you. When they're seeking volunteer opportunities, um, they too, um, don't like to be connected to the development associate or development officer when they are seeking volunteer activities. And this is for um, two primary reasons. Um, because one, as I alluded to before, there are some sensitivities around being um, solicited for money. And the, the second part of that too is um, they recognize as clear as day that the volunteer coordinator is the key to the castle in terms of getting opportunities with their associates. And again, they know this. The volunteer coordinator often knows um, the exact needs for their organization um, when it comes to that volunteer, volunteer engagement piece of it. Um, so what this means is that each of you have to be very proactive in getting a seat at the table, um, more specifically with the CSR practitioner, um, but also work with your development officer in a way that allows you an ability to not be the dog that's wagged by the tail. Um, secondarily, you know, this also goes back to the previous slide in what's being um, proposed uh, by the development officer. Um, if what is being proposed by the development officer in terms of a corporate engagement, if it's not a good fit, um, I would work on 
um, diplomatically saying no. And here's some warning signs. Um, you know, as you're working to engage, there might be certain things that end up being red flags that you might just want to be aware of. You know, if a company only has time for emails or calls, they're likely not interested in serving for your reasons or um, to have a, a true impact. Um, or maybe uh, they believe they'll have a true impact based on um, some flawed reasoning. Um, and they might even be there to explore easy engagement if they're, um, if they're not meeting in person. And again, um, the other thing that I will mention is that this could also be a silent communication to you that that's the way that they're going to set boundaries, um, which again speaks to um, what I shared before of um, in regards to true interest. Um, you know, if a company's pattern is to seek short notice style engagement on um, too short notice, it's likely indicative of their culture of service or a motive that could be harmful to your operations. Um, so while this isn't always the case, just be mindful of that and work to flesh it out a bit as you're creating some of these partnerships. And as we come to the conclusion of this, um, I just want to wrap up a, a few key points here. You know, understanding that um, for profits, uh, for, for profit companies um, are designed to make money. Understand that they do have some limited uh, some limitations in what they can and cannot do. Also, um, getting beyond a single day of service, it it's going to take some real effort. Um, it's difficult, and um, you'll just need to be very deliberate and patient on how you do that. There are also many sensitivities um, that if not avoided will make uh, your realistic volunteer ask that on arrival. Um, and so I always caution people to watch their step. Um, when connecting to corporate volunteers, again, do your research and understand their motives. Uh, use this to your advantage to, to really understand um, uh, what's driving their actions. And then always seek mutual benefit in identifying um, how you can help solve their issues at a company, um, because that will really play to your favor when you're able to find that shared value. And then lastly, um, as best as possible, don't be a pawn to someone else's short-sighted, ill-informed decision-making. When it comes to volunteer engagement, um, you really have to be deliberate and you really have to make sure that it's a good fit. And that concludes my presentation. Are there any questions? So uh, I will just share a couple questions with you. We'll just do a couple minutes since I know we're, we're at our time and then we can share the recording back out. So just appreciated the examples you shared about the food bank and about you know, the staffing, kind of resume building, job shadowing. How would you suggest that nonprofits get those kinds of real win-win mutual benefit partnerships started? Those were just great examples with Marriott. How would you suggest that a nonprofit uh, create a partnership like that or get something started like that with a company that they're working with? I think the first thing is to really have an honest conversation with those that you, you know, your point of contact at a company. Uh, when I say an honest conversation, I think, you know, understanding that companies they have to make money first and foremost you know i always think about well what's going to be operations friendly what can we present to employees that will not just resonate with them passionately but also work for their company and so the other word that i always start throw around is turnkey but in order to get to understand what's operations friendly and what's turnkey is to sit down and have an honest conversation with um, those that you're working with to really understand that the things that they're looking to get. Um, some might be just looking for that in, that employee engagement check in the block, um, but others might have a very deliberate thing that they're seeking to achieve, like you know um, developing the employability of youth to also seek them for talent. But I think it really begins with saying, okay, well, this is who we are as an organization, but tell me more about your company and tell me about the, the goals that you have that we might be able to solve for. Great. No, that's really helpful. I know um, a lot of nonprofits obviously are looking for funding and having worked for a nonprofit, you know that as well. Do you think that some of the volunteer examples that you shared 
uh, including, you know, kind of like the thousands of thanks with the trees. Are those ways for nonprofits by having those honest conversations and getting something started to also receive funding from both the company and its employees? And have you seen that work? Uh, the short answer to that is yes. And I will say that, you know, when I was with TAPS, um, that that specific program was spawned as a an answer to one of our larger donors um, looking for something to connect their associates with. So they would, you know, and um, I'll call them out, but USAA, they're, um, I think they're still one of TAPS's top three um, funders. And um, they would fund everything from the good grief camps to some of the very specific um, uh, peer engagement sessions uh, where survivors can work with other survivors in a way that's healing. Um, and what it didn't provide is an opportunity for their associates or, or their employees to really connect with the mission in a deeper way. And so um, as a result of getting that feedback from our donor, um, I think that's when we really took a, a, a hard look internally to say, well, what can we do that's actually going to engage your associates? Um, and so, yeah, I, I think I think that the, again, the, the short answer to that is yes. Um, you know, USAA was is is still one of TAPS's biggest um, supporters um, philanthropically and through volunteer engagement. Um, and so, us making that change was to meet both of our needs. And the last question, as I know we want to respect your time as well, have you seen in your work with Marriott with the different volunteer projects that you're working on, do these sometimes come as suggestions from the employees or do you really feel like you're leading it from your office and so the nonprofit relationships are completely with your office or does some of it bubble up from the staff? Uh, it's a little bit of both. So. Um, you know, while we create the strategy from our office, um, you know, I would say that globally there are 40-ish organizations that we have memorandums of understanding with. These are organizations globally that we have um, a philanthropic partnership with. But from the market level, from our specific hotels, there are probably upwards of 12,000 unique organizations that are supported through our 6,700 properties. And so a part of it is designing strategy that makes sense. But then the other part of it too is um, providing the latitude for the associates to make those decisions based on what makes sense for their community. Um, you know, we see that the, the challenges that they have in rural India are not the same that we have here in Arlington, Virginia. Um, and so by providing that latitude, um, the associates on property are oftentimes able to, again, within our strategy, um, are able to choose organizations and to create grassroots uh, volunteer um, uh, connections based on what makes sense for their specific communities. So it's a little bit of both. Wonderful. Well, I think that's all the time we have, Drum. Thank you so much for joining us, and thank you to everyone else for joining us. So, Kelsey, we'll let you wrap it. Thank you everyone for taking the time to join us in a review on corporate social responsibility, making it work for your organization's volunteer program. Have a wonderful day.